Hi, everybody. This is Paul Ward. I'm executive director of Artichoke Music. And uh, part of the reason that I work there is that one of the gentlemen on this call, one of the people on this call, Max Tucker, made the introduction uh, to the previous executive director, uh, Bob Howard, um, who deserves all kinds of kudos for keeping Artichoke going during the um, during COVID. And uh, I was very grateful for that introduction. I consider uh, Max Tucker a dear friend. And uh, so ever since we met formally at a jam session, which is pertinent to us talking about the Lit Jam, um, at Clyde's. We were at Clyde's and you introduced yourself. And uh, I think I'd heard that you were in town from a mutual friend, but I was very delighted to meet you. And yeah. um, so that's, I'm going to just uh, hand this over to the people, let, let you guys introduce yourselves and your instruments. And um, I want Laura to talk about, you have a Tuesday jam still, Laura, on a regular? Absolutely. Okay, good. So why don't we start with Max and then go to Laura and then go to Sam. Is that okay, order? Yeah. Okay, Max, you're up. All right. Hi, I'm Max Tucker and uh, I'm a drummer. I moved here from New York about five, six, yeah, five, six years ago. Um, kind of started to get established here, like right before the pandemic and then, um, but after the pandemic, I really started to go out hard, hardcore to jam sessions in, in town. And that's when I connected with Sam and Laura and everybody pretty much that I am connected with now. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I love jazz. Uh, I, I went to school for it in, in New York at the new school, uh, graduated in 2004, studied with <clears throat> Michael Carvin, who was my main teacher, but a lot of other people like Cecil McBee, Junior Mance, um, Billy Harper, a lot of Reggie Workman. Uh, yeah, just tons of great experiences. And then after school, I kind of stopped playing jazz for a while, pursued more pop pop music, played with a group called Francis and the Lights, which Sam's a fan of, we found out uh, recently. Um, but, um, but when I moved to Portland, I really, when I moved here, I really got back into jazz, inspired by the, co the community here, uh, which is so open and accepting, but also like so um, good. There's so much substance here, you know? So, Okay. Yeah, that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Well, I'm going to add a couple of postscripts, then we'll move on to Laura. Um, Max is a wonderful player. He's a very sensitive player. He's got a lot of stuff going on. But one of the things I, maybe we can talk about in another Zoom call is uh, being a commercial musician in the sense of being able to cover jazz, but also pop or other styles. Um, that that's You can probably speak from experience that this opens up opportunities for you to meet new communities, to play different kinds of music, to keep your ears open, to get more gigs, you know? Yeah. So anybody who's thinking, hey, what's my future like in, in the music world, they could benefit from a separate Zoom call where we could talk about your experiences across these different genres. So if you're up for that, let's uh, bookmark that, okay, Max? Yeah, let's, I'm up for it. Good. Yeah, I'd definitely <laughs> say to, for any anyone, any instrument, um, if you can play, more more than one genre it's it's ideal you know um i have you know i know horn players like to play in like salsa bands or funk bands um because it just gives them another perspective i'm sam can talk about that but uh yeah well, so, great well, well maybe we'll get to that laura uh I'm so pleased you're on this call. And I just want to say personally, Laura Kennard is one of my favorite people and one of my favorite musicians. And she's an excellent pianist and she'll be uh, serving that role also. I, I may be singing at the Lit Jam um, coming up um, and has been a presence on the scene forever. And I'm always delighted to spend time with her and to hear her. She does a Tuesday Jam, which you can talk about. And um, uh, I had the pleasure of playing behind you at the underground it was one of my fav favorite evenings i really love that and my right. wife was there and she said i love laura <laughs> Which, the true yeah. thing. all right so laura get, tell us about yourself okay well thank you thanks for inviting me to play the jam and, and be here to, on today's call um 
I have always considered myself a bit of a musical chameleon. I went through school as a classical piano performance major with probably the tiniest hands in the department, which didn't help. Um, and frankly, I only went through with classical because I was too frightened to be a jazz major. Um, this was back in the late 70s, early 80s. And the jazz departments were just kind of getting started in a lot of the universities. Um, so even even the jazz majors had to study with a classical piano teacher. But, so I found that kind of interesting. But I've done piano bars and show bands and R&B and gospel and rock and uh, country. Um, and I, I always just kind of played, I, I say I played at jazz for a long time and um, ended up getting married. I went, I grew up in Seattle, got married, moved to California. Um, and at 25, I actually walked away from a 10 year performing career and didn't play out very much for the next 20 years. Wow. And then when my first husband passed away, I jumped back into music full time within a, a matter of weeks and started going to Ron Steen's jam sessions. And at the time, Ron had about five per week that he was hosting and just really, really dedicated myself to the, the jazz side of things and I'm trying to hardly to, even I'm looked to, at sorry what's to, that? I'm, sorry to interrupt, but I'm trying I'm trying to get Portland back to that those Ronstein days. Oh, oh, that would be so awesome. <laughs> Five jams a week. Yeah, oh. less less than a year after my first husband passed away, I was offered a fledgling jam. Mm -hmm. It because the uh, the guy who was hosting it quit and walked out and they called me the next day because I'd been attending for several weeks and they said, "Well, would you like to go ahead and host it?" And so feeling very unsure of myself and and not having the playing skills even to um do it I, I i said yes and that was my first regular jazz gig ever and i that was 2005 i have been hosting a, at least one weekly jazz jam every tuesday since 2005 Amazing. um when one club would close down or quit the jam, I'd get a call within an hour from somebody who knew what was happening and saying, hey, bring it to my club now. And so I just moved from club to club where I've been Tuesday. I've been there seven years since they opened. Um, so it's been it's been a wonderful ride. I've gotten to play with Paul and a lot of the really, really wonderful players in town. And I, I still consider myself a student. Um, I teach jazz voice at PSU now. That's great. Yeah. So singing, working... I I love to play, but I live to sing. Oh, you're a wonderful. Told. You're a wonderful singer, and you, I guess you get to work with Sherry Owls, right? Yes. She's on the board of Artichoke Music, thanks to me. Nice. Yeah, nice. she's awesome. Uh, well, that's... she's she's a magnificent teacher. I've yeah. I've accompanied some of her students and I've sat through some of her classes and I'm just absolutely in awe of her teaching ability. She's great. I, I love her so much. She's such a contributor to the scene. So we've had uh, Max whose history and future is in jam sessions and Laura, you just told us your, your jam session history. Now we get to one of the young lions, I think in town, Sam. Um, and I'm going to say some embarrassing things about Sam. I, I think the first time I heard you play was at the Monday night jam session at the 1905. So this jam session theme continues. And I was just so happy to hear you play. I think the two saxophone players I was have been introduced to at the jam that have um, made me really want to play with them would be you and Ben, who's a wonderful player too. Um, so I want to know, uh, tell everybody about your background and uh, your relationship to jam sessions and where are you playing? Tell people about Sam. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, thanks, Max and Laura, for uh, setting the tone, too. Um, yeah, so yeah, I really got into jazz when I was a kid. Um, you know, when it came time to pick an instrument in, uh, in middle school, like in sixth grade, it was always going to be the saxophone. 
Um, I, I didn't have any, and I never really seriously pursued anything else in like a formal context. Um, so really I've been, I just got into that immediately and just started playing. Um, so had the chance to pursue it more seriously in college. I also, um, went to school for jazz, um, you know, not so much in like such a heavy environment, you know, like Max did. It was kind of, it was a different environment, which was out of Whitman College in Walla Walla. And they had, it wasn't a very big program, but they, because of the academic kind of reputation of the school, they were able to attract some talent that I think a school, you know, that, that had a similarly sized school with a less competitive program wouldn't. Um, mostly I'm talking about uh, Dave Glenn, who was a, uh, a veteran of kind of um, New York City in the 70s and 80s and touring in Europe with big bands. And he'd kind of become a really great educator. So we were really lucky to have him out there. Um, so just got to absorb a lot of experience from someone who'd really been there and kind of with the bands that were keeping the, the torch going, you know, in like the 70s and 80s. Um, and so just being around him, despite the fact that it wasn't, you know, immersed in like a in, in this real scene out there in Eastern Washington, it was still um, a low stakes environment to kind of engage with the music in a way that was not, there wasn't a lot of pressure. And, you know, there's there's pluses and minuses to that. So I think kind of as a result of that, I ended up not playing uh, for a couple of years right after I graduated. Um, and then part of the main reason for that was because I wasn't embedded in a community. Um, that was when I was up in Seattle and there's a great community up there. I just wasn't really plugged into it. And so really my moment of coming back into the music, I think like that's what we all share. It sounds like was moving back to Portland in 2016, moving uh, in and having not been playing seriously or pursuing, you know, despite this past experience and despite this passion that was still alive, just very disconnected from it. And so moving in with uh, my good friend, uh, Peter Walter Bircher, or Peter QB, another just kind of fixture on the scene, really, um, uh, he's like a brother to me, but moving back in with him and just him kind of, even though I couldn't really play that great at that time, just letting me sit in, taking me out to the sessions, just really integrating me into the community. Um, and so I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him. Uh, so anyway, that's the backgrounds. Um, fast forward to today, uh, been glad to be a part of the Lit Jam a couple times in the recent past, um, and get to play with Max once a week uh, on Wednesday nights over at Fortune. That's uh, it's a gig um, headed up by Sam Durazo, but uh, it, so it's not a jam per se, but it's very sit-in friendly uh, for anyone who's listening. So uh, we go from nine to eleven thirty over there. That's good. That's good. Um, and that's in the jazz context, but kind of touching on that theme that we talked about, you know, um, I have some good friends and some musical collaborators that are kind of, that are outside the jazz world, more in like the Portland indie scene, the kind of the, the singer songwriter and also the hip hop side of things. So that is kind of what stretches me, you know, outside the jazz world. And it's funny, I, uh, I used to play in more funk bands and I have friends who are in the salsa game just since we touched on that subject, I kind of, I feel more drawn to like playing in weirder contexts, you know, like, like just free form kind of going into the studio with a hip hop, you know, producer, and then just kind of saying, really not giving any instructions, just kind of saying, Hey, play on this, play something or, or sitting in, you know, or rehearsing with an indie rock group. And they're, they're not coming from the same formal context or the same context of like giving you something to do. So I like that. Yeah, that's great. Intensely creative uh, uh, situation that you're finding yourself and your tastes are that way too. And I, I find young people, and I think the audience for the Zoom call is largely going to be some of the younger players who are going to be coming in because we're going to be discussing the set list for the upcoming um, uh, Lit Jam on the 15th, 16th, 18th, 17th, 18th? 18th. 18th. Thank you very much. On the 18th. Uh, February. Um, well, I think one of the things that young people have uh, as a superpower that we did not have so much growing up, maybe uh, some, some of you, Sam, because you're a little bit younger, but um, 
you know, when Max and I and Laura and I were, were coming up, we had LPs and we had CDs and there were releases and we would look forward to the releases. But now you can get any music, any genre, 24 hours a day. And the tastes of the young people today are drawn to textures and vibe, not so much what was popular in the 60s, what was popular. The, they might explore it that way, but they absorb it and they bring all that stuff into their own playlist. Um, and, you know, and I think that sort of neo soul jazz stuff today is, is bringing in a lot of those um, non-traditional jazz sounds and textures. Uh, and I think the future is very promising for improvised music, especially for young people. Um, to get some of that vocabulary though, and then have some fun with people who can just sit in and play, it's nice to have those, a knowledge of those standards because you can develop your stage presence and musicianship and to build a community that we're talking about and when you can show up and know some standards and um, uh, not everything needs to be, um, you know, super big production project. It can just be, you know, you playing really interesting stuff over time-tested tunes. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, I just want to first say what the list is and you can find it on the artichoke uh, music.org uh, website. Um, I'll put the link in the lower thirds below. Um, and I don't know where they're going to be in this order, but I'm just going to say them out loud. And anyone who's listening, you should write them down or, or look them up on YouTube or, or Spotify. Straight No Chaser, Max is selected, and that's a Thelonious Monk tune. Am I right there? Yeah. And then you selected Milestones. Now, if someone calls Milestones on the bandstand, the first question people ask is old or new right right mm, this, this is old this is the old all right so anybody listening on listening to this uh, go figure out what the difference is because you may you may need that information someday um i wish you love is that the blossom dairy version yeah i mean yeah. she didn't write it but yeah yeah the version it you was have written on... by charles trenet thank you charles charles trenet <laughs> That's why, you're here. Prenez, oui. That's why you're here, yes. Laura. No, exactly. Le reste de is the original title. Thank you. I sing it in French, by the way. <laughs> See? Value. Beautiful. Adding Beautiful. value. Adding Beautiful. value. Yes. Uh, next tune is Indiana or Back Home Again in Indiana, which is uh, a great one to know because there's so many tunes written on the same chord changes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's a you, you learn this one, you learn five songs, right? Um, yeah. They can't take that away from me, George Gershwin. Um, I like to use the Tom Grant chord changes on that, which some people know and some people don't. Um, and uh, I just love that song. It's a great one. Little My Little Suede Shoes is the next one up uh, on my list. And um, uh, that's one, we can talk about that one as, as sort of an intro to Charlie Parker stuff. But, um, and then Bemsha Swing, which is written by my, probably my favorite pianist forever, Bill Evans. And um, and I'll start the, let me start the conversation on these tunes, starting with that one. Wait, Bem Bemsha Swing is not Thelonious Monk tune? I, I think he recorded it, but I think Bill Evans wrote it. Wow. I think, I think Monk wrote it. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah I think, I'm pretty sure. All right, then I stand corrected. We'll see, here you are. Um, mm -hmm. I thought he, anyway, so, I stand corrected or sit corrected here in the studio. All right. Uh, the version of Bench Swing that I first heard was Bill Evans. Mm. And he did it on an album called Conversations with Myself, which won a Grammy Award. The Grammy Grammys are. So I've heard, I mean, there's versions of Monk doing it like in the 40s. Oh, well, then I guess Bill Evans didn't write that. Because um, I think uh, Conversations with Myself came out like in 1970 or something like that. 72 maybe i don't know somewhere in there and that's All bill right. evans just as a pianist recording over bill evans the pianist recording over bill evans the pianist i think he had four or five tracks six tracks oh. sometimes and the planning you have to go through to make uh to to arrange that um is incredible and uh because there's some engineering tricks in there too but it won a grammy because of the beauty of the music and the uh, virtu virtuosity of the engineering. Um, but I wanted to mention it because uh, most young players nowadays have the ability to record themselves digitally and to record over themselves digitally. So it'd be very interesting when you learn a song and you would learn a song to 
internalize it. You might do the arpeggios, you might do the scales, you might do little melodic riffs over the chord changes. It'd be interesting to be think, thinking about how you might record over yourself um, to, to make something beautiful out of the different ways you might practice the tune. It just could be interesting. So I just throw that out there. If you guys want to check out Conversations with Myself version of the Thelonious Monk tune, Bench of Swing, you can probably find that on YouTube. And I'm going to leave it at that. You guys, who, who wants to take the next song to chat about? I definitely will check that out. Um, yeah, I got, I selected two Thelonious Monk songs. The first one is Straight No Chaser. Um, I mean, that's just a classic al classic track. It's the version from Milestones, the al Miles Davis album. No. Uh, first track, I think. No, maybe not. I don't know. But, <clears throat> but uh, it's just very iconic. All the solos are, are just classic jazz solos um what can i say you know jazz listen, listen to it right anything to say uh i totally agree with you uh it's definitely one of those classics where y y you're gonna love listening to it and it's it's gonna be light light work falling in love with it and then you're gonna internalize it just by listening to it because you're gonna love it so much one of those blues heads that's just yeah i don't know <clears throat> Sam, maybe you could talk a little bit about it or blues, <clears throat> blues yeah. hands. Because you, you, you love blues. Yeah, I mean, this this one's a must know, you know. And it, I, I find it interesting just like this version relative to the OG, which is like, it's a pretty medium B-flat blues when Monk records it um, initially. And that's, I think that's telling to me I, just that some people are cool with playing a medium tempo B-flat blues and some people aren't. Right. And I think maybe Miles wanted to make it a little edgier. So they, isn't, they take it this, an F yeah, an and they, F, take, it, yeah, and they take it up. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's like some, yeah, some just some live versions of them playing this at a ridiculous tempo and yeah. can't involve those crazy things on it. But um, the Newport, Newport version is great too. Yeah. <clears throat> I, yeah. One of one of the things I want to jump in here and say, uh, the thing about Straight No Chaser as a head is that um, it's um, very syncopated and does require some work. But the, the, the one of the things I mentioned before we started the call was I think of it as being uh, of a piece with how Monk uh, wrote a lot of his stuff. He treated the piano like a percussion instrument which officially it is um, and he loved drummers and he loved the way drummers divided the beats in order to create suspension and it's, um it's uh, fascinating to listen listen to him how he plays with different drummers oh yeah and how Talk different about. and how different drummers play off of monk play with monk um you know roy haynes versus frankie dunlop for example or you know because they play so differently, <clears throat> um, and they they kind of make Monk play differently too. That's cool. That's cool. They make the, they make the band sound different, obviously, as as the, only the drummer can. Because they the way they give space, the way they react to the rhythms that are happening, or or just to kind of allow them to happen, or or offer like a counter rhythm. But um, yeah, so Roy Haynes is like more counter rhythms, kind of more against the beat. Whereas like Frankie Dunlop was more kind of flowing, kind of more like groove. Um, I don't know. Not that Roy Haynes isn't isn't flowing, but um, I'm just thinking it's, about it. Yeah, different thing. Well, Art and Blakey, yeah. I mean, obviously Art Blakey and Monk is is probably my favorite. Yeah. But. I love Art Blakey. I, I, I think one of the meta comments I'd make about this is one of the values of going to a jam session as opposed to just studying on your own is one of the things that's exciting to do is to play with other people and find out in the moment, because you're not going to know about it usually beforehand, what the chemistry is going to be on the bandstand. Who's going to be driving? Who's going to be listening? How, how does that conversation go? That's that is as much of a set of skills as knowing what scales to play or what arpeggios to play or what extensions to play or all those kinds of things that you might otherwise study on your own. You know, yeah. Putting them in practice with a group is awesome. 
Yeah. So go out and listen. Everyone who's watching this, you know, I encourage you to go out and listen to all the, you know, different versions of this song or all these songs, really. Um, it's always good to do, to get different perspectives. Would you guys agree? Totally. Absolutely. Totally. All right. So the next one is I Milestones. My, I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> next one's Old Milestones. Um, Laura, do you want to talk about this one? I mean, I, I picked Not it. Really. Actually. <laughs> um, All right. I have to admit, I am so vocal centered. Most okay. of these tunes I never play unless I show up at somebody else's gig or jam or something. Right on. Well, I, I actually picked this one be for Sam because he's a big Joe Henderson nut. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. And I actually, I really hadn't checked out this album. And I like John Schofield too. So. Yeah, I appreciated this pick. Also, this is, yeah, and this is a, I never learned this tune. Um, and it's it's not an easy tune. There's some stuff. The album, the album just to clarify, is Joe Henderson's So so Near, So Far. Musings for Miles. Um, so it's all, it's all Miles or Miles adjacent or inspired original songs. But uh, yeah, so I mean, this is a, this, this is, it's not an easy head to just play off the top. Um, there's some stuff you have to learn. And uh, you know, I'm still I'm still working on perfecting it. And there's a lot of changes flying by in fairly quick succession. So Sorry I appreciate seeing this one. No, it's Sorry good. I mean, it. <laughs> no, it's good because we need to be able to reckon with stuff like this. Um so I was I'm the, I'm the drummer. It's easier for me. So I'm sorry. No, <laughs> it's good. It's good. Don't apologize. I, I do want to say I just looked up that album. Um it was number one on the top jazz album charts in 1993. So this is not, this is, this is a good piece of vocabulary for people to Joe, pick up. Joe, Joe Henderson had, had a huge, um, you know, his career really took off in the nineties, right? Yep. Yeah. He was, uh, he was like under the radar in the sixties kind of when he came out. Yeah. He was born right. 1937. Still, right still fresh today. So we don't know, yeah. maybe we don't have as much to say about that one, but. It, well, you got to know it and you got to listen to the Joe Henderson album. Just got to do and it. Charlie Parker played it. So, I mean, that's another reason I think it's important. Cool. Um, then next we have I Wish You Love. This is the Blossom Deary version. Um, per, I picked it personally because in New York, I used to go to the, the jam session at Smoke in Harlem. Um, and the door, the doorman, uh, Tommy <clears throat> is a great guy. He, uh, and he would, every night he would close out the jam by singing this song. <laughs> he had a great voice, like a nice kind of Johnny Hartman-esque voice. So I really fell in love with the song and it always brings me back to that, that memory. That's, that's the place in the basement of Marcus Samuelson's restaurant. Is that right? <laughs> No, no, it's um no, it's 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 not in a basement. It's like okay. 106th and Broadway, I think. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. It's all right. I I I love I love Blossom Deary's version of it because and I'm sort of stepping into things that Laura knows more about than I do. Um she had a very distinctive uh, way of forming her sounds. Uh forming her words so when she sings the word storm often a singer might leave it quite open until the very end but she just holds on to that r as and i think uh diane diana crawl does the same thing so storm there's a lot of r in it and when you listen to singers and you and you, you particularly in the jazz world um i think one of the things to listen for is what kind of point of view are they bringing to the way they approach a note and approach a word that uh, is distinctive. And why are they doing that? It just same the same way you listen to any musician on the stage. The jazz singer is a musician as well, who has been uh, working to create a sound and to create so something that isn't often, not always, but often isn't just a way of delivering the lyric in a transparent way. They're trying to deliver the lyric in a way that has character and personality. 
But that's just my thought about this. Um, Laura is the real singer here, at least as far as I know. So what do you think about that? Um, I'm going to have to go back and listen to the Blossom Deary version. Truthfully, I, I haven't heard that. It sounds like if she's saying Storm, she must sing it in English. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the English lyric has a completely different message mm. than the French lyric. The French lyric is an older woman remembering an affair she had years previous oh. and looking at this old picture, this old photograph and kind of reminiscing and wow. Hope, wow. hoping that this old lover is off somewhere happy. Um, wow. What a great so insight. It's it, So it, it's obviously going to come from a different perspective depending on whether you choose the English lyric or the French lyric. Mm. That's a very good point. Very good point. Does Blossom sing the verse? Um, I think she does. Mm. I don't remember if it, she does it on this recording. I haven't lis listened to this recording lately. Uh, mm. You know what? I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to correct myself. The singer in the French version is not old at this point. It, it's right when the the affair ends. But she's thinking about when I'm an old woman, I'm going wow. to look at this photograph and I'm going to remember mm. wow. this that's... affair fondly. So it's, yeah, it's. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> it's very cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool song. Um, <clears throat> it's like complex emotions, you know, that it's trying to port convey. It, it does raise an interesting question too. There are a lot of songs that we do in the jazz world that have complex emotions, but uh, when the instrumentalists get hold of them, they tend to make the medium or up, which which right. changes the the spirit of the song. Like Autumn Leaves is a very sad song, and it's you often called at like quarter note equals two twenty, right? It's like <laughs> uh, anyway, but you know, it's just part of the world. So if you if you learn "I Wish You Love" as a ballad, and uh, you're ready to play it behind a singer, or if you are a singer and you, and you learn the words, you have choice of French or English. You have a choice as a ballad to try to bring out those emotions, but if you learn it as a ballad, you can play it up tempo. So you know that's. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna check out the. I'm gonna go check out the French versions now. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's... Um, Charles Trenet, who is the composer, he was a '30s and '40s cabaret singer in mm. France, and he was like one of the most famous performers ever. Mm from yeah from the french culture and he wrote uh Paris, he, one of he my wrote favorites. beyond the sea yeah that bobby darren made a hit out of in english wow. and and wow. a whole bunch of songs yeah. that we have in our jazz repertoire but cool. an another really really quick story to interject here about Please. turning something into a ballad versus speeding it up or horn players taking over a song my dad told me a story once about going to hear a sax player and he was in the middle of a ballad and he, he quit playing. And his piano player said, what happened, man? And he said, I forgot the words. Oh my God. That sounds like Dexter Gordon, someone like that. <laughs> I doubt my dad from Nebraska ever saw Dexter Gordon, but who knows? <laughs> well, um, uh, we've lost uh, Max's video for a second, but can, hey, Sam, there you are. Sam, how would you? How would you? Uh, let's talk about Indiana for a second. Tell yeah, me for sure. Is this an important song for people to know? Well, I think it is, and I was glad to see this one come up on the list because I did. I don't. I didn't know the melody to Indiana previously. I mean, I think it's for this generation. You know, for that for the previous generation. You know. Uh, the bebop cats, you know, coming from the swing era, this was like a swing era tune that you had to know. Yeah. I mean, everyone knew it. Um, and then, you know, as a result of it being so omnipresent, you know, uh, Donna Lee was written, which became like the dominant tune, you know, on these changes. And I think that's a much, for our generation, that's a very common tune to know and to play. So it is, so I think it is important to go back and look at the roots of it. Um, it, it was for me. I mean, I it was yeah. it was kind of weirdly difficult to 
hear those changes and kind of stick to a different melody because Donnelly has been so ingrained. Right. Mm. Donnelly. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking, just occurred to me that, you know, like <clears throat> Jocko covered Donnelly. So it was like, all, yeah. And it just like got ingrained into all those fusion cats too. Yeah. Like it's just, it's just such a part of the, you know, like the music, just right. all, yeah. all music. Yeah. Practically speaking, it offers like, I think the tune is significant. I mean, Indiana and then, you know, just the framework of it is significant because it, it really embodies a lot of the like harmonic devices that were, that the beboppers were piggybacking on that they really liked from the swing era. I mean, um, you know, a dominant two chord, for instance, right. Um, that's pretty prominently featured. And then like, you know, a major four to minor four movement. Um, and I think, and so then like Donna Lee in turn kind of gives us a lot of language that, you know, just sounds really good on those chord movements. Yeah. Um, I, to I, I totally agree with you on that. Let me just interject here and say, uh, both tunes are really good to listen to because um, they contrast each other in terms of the melodies. Uh, one of them is very arpeggiated. Indiana is very arpeggiated, whereas Donnelly is very scalar, chromatic. Um, and like you say, harmonically, you got everything that you need to learn. You got your major tonalities covered. You got minor tonalities covered. You got a nice dimin fully diminished chord in there too. And uh, so, you know, it's a great workout uh, and you really can keep it as fresh as you want to make it. And I think one of the one of the things about Donna Lee that's so great, it's sort of a challenge about it, but it's a great is that so much of the bebop vocabulary is present in the head itself, which is typical of Charlie Parker heads. So if you wanted to start developing some bebop vocabulary, I would just say break down Donna Lee take the things that sound good to you, figure out why they sound good to you and put them in three or four different keys. Um, and, and and that's going to be, you know, six months of work and that's going to be fantastic because there's so much in there. That's a good point. Uh, like so much is in those heads, like just learning the heads alone. Just sing, if you can sing along to those Charlie Parker heads, well, it's, it's well, going to yeah, do a it, lot for you. Uh, even Indiana, because uh, yeah. one of the one of the things as you're improvising that you want to understand and get it in your head is what your target notes are on the strong beats. Mm -hmm. Indiana is filled with strong target notes on the beats. You can't necessarily hear them all the time on Charlie Parker. So, I mean, they're in there, but they, you know, you're, that's like a freight train going through and, and Indiana just makes it really crisp and clear. And once you get those target notes in your head by singing Indiana, then you can do on each of those notes or different versions of the arpeggios, you can do your surround tones and you can do your different ap approaches. So it's just a really, it's just, you know, it's a great tune to know. It's a great tune to constantly challenge you. Laura, your thermos is almost as big as mine. Yeah. But not quite. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. There we go. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I love my tea 24 seven. Um. They can't take that away from me. Do we have opinions about this song? You know, I do, and I'm not. I know I'm going to let the vocalists uh, <laughs> and and such speak on this. But like, the thing that strikes me about this song is you can't just, as a horn player, you can't just play like you know more abstract like post bebop vocabulary on the song and sound good. You have to, this song forces you to be able to play things that are just really sweet. Um because that's just the context. So um, I just, I think that it, it's, it's deeply in the tradition. I mean, it's one of the great melodies. It's just one of the great tunes like of all time. Um, and one of so the great horn recordings. Players, yeah, one of the great recordings, like this one in particular, it's just yeah. like, you have to know it. Um, so as a horn player, I just feel like it really, it forces you to like be able to play that part of the tradition, play with a really nice sound where you can just yeah. play yeah. one note and just have it, you know, be really pretty. Yeah. That's why I love Sam, you know, Epstein playing with him because he, you know, a lot of the modern, the younger guys don't, <clears throat> don't know that, you know, they don't, they can't play more simply and just relate it related to the melody as well as he does. So. 
That's that's great. I, I think uh, my one of my favorite people, Sam, you, you remind me of this from a an aesthetic standpoint. One of my favorite examples of incredibly melodic and sensitive playing on slow ballads is John Coltrane's playing on the Johnny Hartman album. Um, so if anybody out there wants to pick up that, it's like the classic of all time. So Johnny Hartman, John Coltrane. Um, one of the things I like about this tune from a harmonic standpoint, I want to hear Laura's opinions on this too, um, is in the A section, you have your, you start in the tonic and then you you uh, transition to the subdominant, which is a classic transition in jazz. And then there's a brief mention of the, of the, um, in the cycle of fifths of the next fourth up, which is you know, if you're doing this in E flat, it goes from E flat to E flat seven to A flat to D flat for a second, which is really cool. It's a really nice thing to do. It's a temporary sort of super leaving, leaving what's going on. So in that whole first A section, there's a lot of sort of flatness going on, right? But then you get to the bridge and the second note of the melody is outside the key right? It's a tritone up from the root and it just opens it up. It's, it's, it's opening and yet it's a little edgy and uh, it creates- well, It's a, leading you to that next key. La -da -dee. Right. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think I like about this way of thinking about things is when you're thinking about improvising, you can choose those, you can identify those notes that set up the next thing you're going to, just like you're talking about, and have those in mind so that those can be the target notes that really show the band that you're playing with and the listener who may not be into heavy improvising, that you know where you are and that you are able to make something melodic out of the, the energy of the changes that Gershwin put there. So I'm gonna stop there. Laura, t tell us. I I think you covered it really, really well. <laughs> One thing I was going to mention is um, if you're going to have a singer on the bandstand singing any of this stuff, it's probably not going to end up being in the same key as the real book keys or what everybody tends to learn everything in. So it's, it's always a, a good idea to try out your music in a couple different keys um, as as a low female voice, I tend to do everything a fourth or a fifth below whatever the real book key is myself. Um, so what key do you do this one in? Like B flat? B flat. Yeah. That's great. Cool. <laughs> and, and there, everyone paying attention, and you should still be paying attention, pay attention to Laura there, because learning things in, in the original key, your work is only one twelfth done. <laughs> yeah, for me, uh, this album you know i was one of i was lucky that i grew up listening to this album so my parents it was on you know one of the fixtures in the car so um it's just kind of ingrained in the in in there and it's just i i, I still return to it now i still love it so classic pairing yeah you can't get better than ellen louis no my parents listened to lawrence welk <laughs> <laughs> a one and a two <laughs> it's funny though because my sister who's several years older than i was actually given a fake book um when i was probably five or six and by the time i was eight or nine i was playing guitar as well as piano wow. and understood basics with chords and so i ended up without hearing a lot of the standards, a lot of the ones I learned today or still perform today, I learned them in out of fake books hmm. when I was between eight and 11. Wow. And then when I did hear them, it was on either Lawrence Welk or Hee Haw. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even that hip to those references, but I got to oh. go check those out. Well, I'm older than you are. I figured Paul I know. would know who yes. I mean. He has. I, I mean, I've I've heard I know I've heard the names, but yeah. A ask your <laughs> ask your folks about hee haw. They will they will laugh out loud. I guarantee you. Sam, do you have any opinions about this song? This is a. I mean, you've you've already shared sort of like the melodic thing, but it, it, we're talking about fake books. We're talking about keys. 
any any thoughts on those topics? Yeah, I think yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, uh, playing these songs in multiple keys, especially as a horn player, you can get mm, you can get called out pretty quickly if you if you can't you know go on the fly. Um, and so, but this tune is very doable to do that with. I mean, it's I think this is the kind of tune that most musicians can work their way up to like being able to conceptualize and kind of get enough facility to play through this tune in a number of keys because it's logical. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the bridge, yeah, the bridge modulation is like, it, it hits and it's, you know, it's dramatic, but it is logical as well. Um, so I think, I think that this is a great type of tune to practice doing that on. It, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, even, I agree. Even the melody. Um, sometimes yeah. the melody is goofy, but, uh, yeah, so I, that's why I like kind of seeing this type of tune on a list like this, a tune that I, you know, I wouldn't call it on a gig because I don't, it doesn't come to mind, um, as like in terms of just an instrumental context. Mm -hmm. Um, but that being said, it's a great reminder that you can call those types of tunes and you can play this kind of tune a little bit up, you know, as well. Yeah, and it's I, still, hmm. it's still, it swings, um, I should it also really works that way. I should also mention that um, I did also when I was putting this list together, I was influenced by my my partner Megan Cronin, who is also a singer. Um, she, who said you should have more songs for singers on on the list. So good for her. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She, uh, yeah. She likes to sing "I Wish You Love," so she she'll probably sing that. Good. 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 That's gonna be awesome. Um, she's a fine singer and an excellent musician. Yeah. Um, so uh, one thing I do want to say is uh, we haven't talked about this at all yet, but of the tunes that are here, uh, tunes like uh, They Can't Take That Away From Me, Maybe Indiana, and I Wish You Love, uh, at some point early in a musician's career, they should be able to listen to them, maybe even without knowing the key they're in, and be able to, through their ear training, identify what's happening harmonically and that could be actually a fun little exercise for people to do is to um before you look at the lead sheet uh in the fake book for these put them on listen to it get your instrument out and try to find the roots of the chords just to get your ear connected with the song as opposed to just using the uh the lead sheet that's in front of you and they're they're pretty straightforward um if you don't find it that easy to begin with it, you will find it easier as you do it it's just an issue of doing it so cool. ear training man um right. in fact in fact if there were two lessons here i would say ear training and go to jams right those are my two <laughs> top line the headlines there now my little suede shoes who wants to take this one this is an interesting tune mm. personally I, mean, I... I think it's the easiest charlie parker tune ever written nice yeah, I didn't I didn't know it was a Charlie Parker tune until recently. I mean, it wasn't really on my radar, but then I started hearing it being called at jams and it's a it's a fun tune. It's, um, I played it last night, actually, at, at a jam. Cool. Uh, but yeah, it's just it's like simple, like Laura said, it's, it's like simple. It's it's not a scorching tempo. Right. It's pretty. Yeah. It does require you to play pretty simple stuff. And that may seem easy, but that's the sort of deceptive thing about some of these simple, easy songs is, the, is that the challenge is to keep it interesting, right? If you have two choruses on this, that's way too much usually. But let's imagine you had to do two choruses on this. Um, how would you start? what's the middle what's the end so maybe on these simpler tunes the challenges are are, are not going to be trying to figure out the scale you're going to play because the tempo is slow enough you can figure that out or what arpeggio are you going to play because the tune is slow enough you can figure that out the question can be how am i going to compose my my way through 32 or 64 bars of this and, yeah and it's also a straight eighths tune yeah, that's a, we didn't have any of those on the list. 
So and it, and, so and it's and it's not a bossa nova, although it's some, some right. people use kinda that. Like, it kind of touches on that on like Afro Cuban connection with with bebop, which is very you know, very cool. You know, something I'm interested in deeply. We should do it now. So yeah, we'll on that too. We should. Well. I, this is a great list, a lot of diversity. There's a ton of language that people can learn by listening to the tunes that you've put together. Um, as of this afternoon, we've got the song list up and the Lit Jam details up on the artichoke.music.org uh, website. Um, we, already, we already talked about Bemsha Swing. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I started off with that because I, I had to embarrass myself by not knowing who the <laughs> composer actually was. That's all right. We all can grow and we all can learn. Yes, we can. I do it on a regular day. Um, I did look that tune up uh, at one point here just because I was curious. And the, the thing I found of note was that it was apparently co-written by Denzel Best. Oh, that's who right. Was like drummer. a super, a very underrated composer. And drummer. Um, and drummer. Yeah, he has a lot of tunes in the uh, in the repertoire that, I, that are really cool. That's right. That's why I chose tunes it. that used to get played a lot. It's drummer. That's cool. Yeah. Written by a drummer. Yeah, I mean, Monk and Monk had a very close relationship with drummers. Uh, you know, it's just very deep. I don't know enough about it to really talk about it, but I intend to research it more. So one of the things I want to bookmark, Max, with you is having a conversation with a couple of drummers. I get George Colligan on this. He and I did a recorded thing for Ceremon House when I was on the board there. That'd be cool. You know, he, he's a piano player. He's also a drummer. He's also a trumpet player. And then one Laura, of the questions, and he's, and he's Laura's boss. <laughs> yep. Um, one of and the he's things, a bass player too. Yes, yeah. he's he's learning the bass, and of course he's kicking butt doing that too. Um, but one of the questions that I asked him in the interview was, um, how does playing the drums influence your piano playing? And um. And I, and I I broke the interview into several episodes. At, and this is the question I ask at the end of the first episode. And he answers the question, well, that's really interesting. Great that you ask that. And then I cut the end of the first episode. <laughs> I think we should continue that with a conversation with drummers and other musicians who... who I'd, be uh, happy. Yeah, yeah. I'd be happy to be there, yeah. Let's do it. I mean, one of the themes for ceremony, I mean, for uh, artichoke music this year is clave as a rhythmic organizational principle, but also as a key, if you will pardon the pun, to opening up the history about American popular music and about uh, African diaspora music and instrumentation and um, why it is that clave has survived and flourished as an organizing principle for so many genres. It's present in pop music, it's present in blues and rhythm and blues and in jazz. It's everywhere, it's everywhere, but people don't sort of recognize that. And the beautiful thing about clave is it's a rhythm thing, which means drummers get it, right? They totally get it. Um, and it's an organizing principle for music from the 1700s, maybe even earlier. Uh, to today. And if we want to understand each other and understand the music and get joy out of it, then we just learn about these little things and then whole universes open and up, these, communities really, grow up. And these jazz, like the, the jazz innovators really knew about this stuff. I mean, Art Blakey went to Africa. I mean, they really studied. Right. Charlie Doggett's been to yeah. Africa to study this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's worth worth talking about. And I think the this notion that communities matter and that our differences matter and they enrich us. That's what a good jam session is about. You show up on a re on the regular, you're going to get so much out of it. And, uh, you know, the thoughtfulness that is present on, on the stage with the musicians like you guys, you get to peel that back as a musician, you get to peel it back. You get to know these people and, you know, six months, a year, two years later, you're still discovering the beautiful points of view that other musicians bring. And I think talking about things like what the drummer contributes to the stage, how the saxophone player respects or innovates over the changes in new ways, all this is going to make your own music better. 
because you get to fall in love with the points of view of musicians who are taking these standards and doing something completely different with them and they'll never do it exactly the same because the stew always has different ingredients so anyway max i'm going to thank you for uh, for organizing this and the lit jam and uh laura and sam uh, just what a what a pleasure and treat to have you guys on this call thank you all so much thank you everybody. Yeah. thanks yeah. folks good all right you guys take it easy i'll have this up uh, in a flash all right <laughs>